Hello, Chess.com listeners. This is International Master Mark Ginsberg with the first of three segments on the Carries attack, which is a very popular and sharp variation in the Sicilian defense. Let's play over the uh, introductory moves that define the Carries attack. E4, C5, Knight F3, D6. Black can also play E6 on move 2, and it can transpose if white plays D4 takes, knight takes, knight f6, knight c3, and now e6. This is the Shevenigan variation of the Sicilian, so named for a town in Holland, and it features a small pawn center for black on e6 and d6. Notice the trade of pawns in the opening gave black a central preponderance, although this small pawn center is, is rather modestly placed. It's a positional achievement for black to have an extra pawn in the center, but in exchange, white has greater mobility for the minor pieces. So it's going to be a sharp game. In this position, uh, the great Estonian grandmaster, Paul Carries, introduced a move G4 in the 1940s. Earlier than Carries, it was played, but Carries being the strongest player by far who played it, it became known as the Carries attack. In the 40s and 50s, it gained great results for white because black was fundamentally unprepared with how to deal with the uh, pawn rush. White's going to try to advance his pawn more and advance his h-pawn. He's going to, of course, castle on the queen side, and when black castles on the king side, which is most likely, white will try to break through with the pawns. So the Theory was not well developed initially, and black was crushed a lot. But then, antidotes started being worked out, and by the 1970s, the Shevenigan became a mainstay of many solid players' openings, such as Ulf Anderson, who upheld it many times for black, and world junior champion Mark Deason, who unfortunately passed away not too long ago. He was an American player, who played this a lot in his teen years, and scored great results because typically white would overreach and he would counterattack. The opening is a very rich field of study. It's evolving even today. Most recently, uh, Liv Dieter Nispianu, a Romanian grandmaster, won a very interesting game in a Russian tournament, which I'm going to go over in a later segment. But for, for today, I want to go over a few lines to show you the richness of the play and how black can meet this sharp attacking setup. The first one we're going to do today is the move knight c6. This move is well motivated because after all, g4 was not a developing move per se, so black hurries to get his pieces out and castle relatively quickly, and then he'll counterattack in a very systematic manner. Let's see how the play can develop. In passing, note that knight c6 is a recommendation of Kasparov in a book by Kasparov and Nikitin on the Shevenigan. G5, which is the natural follow-up, driving a knight to a less desirable square. Notice the knight can later leap out to E5, though. In this position, white usually follows up by reinforcing his pawns. And now black should hurry to castle. He shouldn't make any pawn moves on the queen side like A6, because those ideas in this variation are typically too slow, and that led to bad black results when the carries attack started being played. So bishop e7, which looks logical. White will reinforce his center knight with bishop e3 and prepare to castle long. Black should hurry and castle short. It looks dangerous castling into a pawn storm, but black is arguing that he will be able to get his pieces out in an effortless manner and counterattack. Let's see how he can do it. Let's say queen to d2, preparing to castle long. Now at this point, black has an important freeing maneuver. Let's see if you can spot a nice way for black to free his pieces. In general, black would like to trade one pair of knights, but only under favorable circumstances where he gains time. The answer is to, well, there are two ways to do it. In this position, he can actually take immediately, or he can play his knight out to e5 first. They're equivalent. Knight takes knight, bishop takes, knight e5. 
Black's not afraid of white doubling the pawns, of course, because black would gain the two bishops and he'd have permanent control of the dark squares. The doubling of the pawns is of no significance and black would stand comfortably better for the rest of the game. White has to watch out for the knight to f3 fork, which is threatened by this move. Or if white were to castle long, black could remove the important attacking bishop and white would not want that either. So in this position, which I've had myself, white normally plays bishop to e2. I had this position against Patrick Wolfe in the 1980s in a Massachusetts Masters tournament. At this point, uh, white has stopped the knight fork on f3 and prepares to drive the knight with f4. Black at this point should retreat the knight to c6, which in turn drives the bishop off the attacking diagonal. Now at this point, this is a very important moment. Let's take a look at this for a second. How should black organize the play? White is going to castle long, and black would like to counterattack. It goes without saying that white plans to pawn storm. The right introductory move, as you might have guessed, is queen a5. This puts the queen out at an active spot, and white goes ahead with the castling long. The thing to notice in these positions is that if the knight on c6 ever were to move, and the king on c1 were to move to b1, in certain positions, the white knight can jump to d5. When the queens are opposed, the white knight is untakeable if the c6 knight has moved away. So black has to be careful of that tactical idea. In this position though, let's look at it again. I've just castled. What do you think the best move is? Do you think it's a6? No, in fact, a6 is too slow. There's a much faster way to organize counterplay. The key way to organize counterplay is the crafty move rook to b8. That's a very important move, which has been seen in the Chinese dragon in recent times. And this is the fastest way for black to attack the king, which he needs to do to stay in the game. Let's say white goes ahead with his pawn storm, black proceeds with his own, and already b4 is a nuisance. This is a serious threat. If white were to ignore with g6, I could simply play b4 attacking the knight, and after white takes on h7, I just hide with the king on h8, which is a nice shelter spot, and after white tries to pry me open with h6, I just defend with g6. It looks scary for black, but he's just in time with his counterattack. At this point, white has nothing better than to retreat the knight, and black can go ahead and grab on a2. In this position of mutually exposed kings, black's chances are no worse. For example, suppose white tried to trade the light, the dark squared bishops to gain access to the king. Black would rebuff that attempt with f6, which looks a little strange, but in fact it works out really well after bishop f4. Now I just build up a big pawn center with e5. And in this position, after bishop g3, knight d4, it's quite obvious that black is faster. For example, f4, bishop e6, queen e3, rook hc8. And it's getting very serious for white because if he were to guard c2, there would be an embarrassing discovered checkmate. If he were to sacrifice on d4, which is more or less desperation, we accept... And at this point, we can hit on c2 again, exploiting the pin. Let's say white were to defend. Now we bring the last piece into play. And it's getting very serious for uh, white. Let's go back a while. This position, of course, was terrible for white and does not represent a good way to play. He was not paying attention very well. So after this... Um, we have the move b5. We saw that g6 didn't work out very well because of b4 and the a2 pawn hangs. Suppose in this position that white wanted to improve. Instead of h5, he could safeguard the king right away with king b1. That wouldn't change things too much because after b5, the b4 move is still very inconvenient. Suppose white were to play b3 to give the knight a place on a4 if b4 happened. Well, in this position, 
black is not too worried about that um, weakening in front of white's king. And he can proceed with rook d8, which places the rook opposite the queen. After h5, b4, knight a4, white appears menacing with the pawns, but it's not very serious and black can defend. One way to defend against a wing attack represented by the advanced pawns is a break in the center. After the knight has been driven away from c3, it no longer has central influence and the d5 move is well timed. After takes, rook takes, for example, queen c1, um, there are a variety of things possible, but the simplest is rook takes, rook takes, and then a developing move, bishop a6, and black is fine. In many endings, the advanced pawns will constitute a weakness rather than an attacking force. The white knight is far afield and cannot participate in the attack. This position is balanced and black is, is happy. So hopefully that gives you an overview of the knight c6 concepts. Let's go back to the uh, beginning. Knight c6, as Kaspera recommended in a rather dated textbook, yet it has validity because it is a developing move. g5, knight d7. One thing you might be wondering about is suppose I try to attack the d6 pawn with knight db5. That's not an issue because I can jump out with my knight defending the d6 pawn. And after white proceeds with the pre-programmed advance of f4, this actually doesn't alarm black because the white knight is strange on b5 and the black knight on g6 is fairly useful doing defensive duties. Let's make some more moves. Let's say white storms at the knight. No need to panic. I just kick the white knight. He returns. Now what can I do? Well, one thing I can do is just take and then black will play on the h file. This is a nice motif exploiting white's overextended pawns. After this move h6, black is uh, comfortable. For example, if I were to play, if white were to play h5, I can just play hg, introducing the uh, h file pin. Let's say white takes back, and now uh, white really doesn't have any threat to speak of, and I could just play b5. And then white fianchettos the bishop. That actually does threaten the knight now. I'm going to put the knight on the permanent central square of e5. In Kerry's attacks, the early pawns by white do weaken center squares. If black is alert, black can often gain these permanent outposts and, and white will be suffering. That's an important lesson on the black side of these things. Let's go back to the beginning. Philosophically, the carries attack, as introduced by this move g4, was not played by Mikhail Tal. Mikhail Tal was one of the most famous attacking players of all time but he believed in certain preconditions for the attack, and for whatever reason, Tal avoided the carry's attack in his career, which may give you some confidence when you're playing the black side. The opening has risks for both sides. G4 is not necessarily strong or weak. It leads to a very principled position. Let's go over some more lines in knight c6. Knight c6 is played, nothing better than g5, knight d7, now at this point, suppose white were to play f4, supporting the pawn wedge in a different way. This move is actually bad. I've had this in tournaments, and it's well known uh, what, how black should play from the textbooks, and the answer is h6. What happens is that white's pawn chain is disrupted because if he supports with h4, there's a pin operating on the h file, and he can't take back with the h-pawn as he would want to. If he takes back with the f-pawn, he has a structurally bad game because the e5 outpost is permanently in black's control. After h6, people often are tempted into a sacrifice with knight takes e6. This move doesn't work, but we should just take a brief look. Fe, of course. Check, that was the idea. And now the king is going up to an apparently awkward spot. But in fact, White, white has no follow-up because he simply doesn't have any pieces out except for the queen. On the other hand, it's easy for black to unravel. Uh, very easy. Let's see how on only a few moves, black has a winning position. At this point, let's say white charges ahead with f5. 
which introduces the bishop into the game. But black doesn't have to worry about this lunge because at this point he can just calmly defend. What should he do? He should oppose the queens. Any queen trade for white is hopeless, of course, being a piece down. That would be completely hopeless. For example, queen takes, king takes, knight here threatening a fork. We just defend. White takes, and we have the permanent outpost. The e6 pawn is falling soon, and white is completely losing. Taking the queen is completely hopeless, so let's say white retreated to h4, but nothing, nothing is happening here. Black can just occupy and at the same time threaten that nasty fork. Let's say white gives a discover check. It looks, it looks maybe scary, but the appearances are deceiving. We just run the king. This fork is still threatened, and black is uh, completely winning. For example, queen here, just take off the pawn. Let's say bishop f4, a6 to stop any kind of knight moves. Let's say castles, just get the king to safety, and black will consolidate quite easily. His knights are beautifully connected permanently, and white cannot introduce more units into the attack. It's worth knowing this simple refutation because you may see this unsound sacrifice in your own games. Let's go back to the beginning of this. Black just played the strong move h6. Remember to play that move if white plays the inaccurate f4 move. We just saw the sacrifice is no good. And on any other continuation, black is going to follow up taking on g5 and gaining the e5 outpost. So f4 is a bad move. What other moves are there? Well, you're most likely going to see bishop to e3 in your games. Or maybe rook to g1. Or maybe h4. These are the most common moves. They all, they all converge to one another. Let's say, for example, h4. We've already done this, but now we'll try a slightly different way. Bishop e7. Let's say bishop to e3. As a side note, if I were to play the lunge f4, which is looking pretty bad because all the pawn moves and no development don't make for a very happy story, I can react with h6 again and white has overextension problems. For example, rook g1 to get out of the pin. Now queen b6, exploiting the fact that the knight is pinned to the rook. That's a very annoying move for white to meet. He has to retreat the knight because if he played the bishop, this pawn would be hanging and that's terrible for white. Knight to f3. Now what does black do? Well, he can do a variety of things. He can just play a6, a typical Sicilian move. And white's in a bit of a, a bind because the white bishop is stuck to the pawn. Let's say queen to e2, for example. Black just stops any further advance of the g-pawn. And black has a very solid formation. White gets out of the attack of the queen. Take, take. And now do you see a nice move for black? A very thematic move. Instead of worrying how to get out the queen side pieces, we notice that white himself is having problems, so we redirect the bishop first to the long diagonal. A very pleasant maneuver that you will see in other Sicilians. After this move, black is very happy. For example, b3 to cut out the attack of the queen on b2. I could jump in with the knight right away. Takes, queen takes, and the queen is nicely centralized. If I oppose the bishop against the queen, black can jump in with the rook, and, and attack the knight. The position is nice for black. Suppose I were to play the knight to a4, attacking the queen. Black can just get out of the way with queen check, and black is uh, very happy. The position uh, shows you that white had trouble coordinating the entire time. So these early f4 moves are not to be recommended. Let's go back to this position. We just played bishop e7. Let's not play f4, which isn't a very good move. Instead of that, let's play our bishop to e3, as we did before. Black should castle. Now, in this position, white could attempt queen to e2. The purpose of that is after castles, the d rook is more unopposed against the black queen. However, the black queen, of course, can move. 
and queen e2 is not weaker or stronger than queen d2, which we saw before. After queen e2, it's perfectly good again to play knight to d e5 to prepare the knight trade, which we saw. I've had this position after f4, and it turns out that the exchange of knights does free black's game pretty well. We retreat the knight to drive the bishop off the diagonal, as we learned before. We put the queen on a5, as we learned before. Everything's proceeding the same. The only difference between this line and the last line is that the white queen was on d2 before, but we still proceed with our pre-programmed rook b8. In this position, um, black is okay. Let's play some moves. h5, b5. There's still an issue with the a-pawn, and white has to worry about it a little bit. For example, he could keep coming with g6, b4, and again, after the uh, taking, we hide, just like before. And after white tries to pry us open, we, we don't let ourselves get pried open. We stay as solid as possible. And the white knight is attacked. So finally, white has to worry about it. And what can white do in this position? He could jump in with the knight, an interesting tactical resource. If The idea is if black were to take, white could take back. And that introduces the possibility of bishop check if the black knight moves somewhere. And then the black bishop would be hanging. So the concept is something like this. Takes, takes, knight somewhere. That's a bad move. Bishop check. And next turn I take the uh, bishop off and white's winning. That's the tactical conception. But if we're calm and take a look, we don't have to play into that. Can you see something better to do? Knight d5 was an ingenious conception, but maybe we can play b3. b3 is a very nice move because if white were, for example, to take the bishop off, we would be making a new, a new queen. And that wouldn't be to white's liking. That would be losing for white because the bishop d4 check is covered, so black is winning. Now, after b3, what to do? Let's see. Well, suppose white were to take. White's operating with the same tactical ideas, but at this point, black can pop in with a check, and after king d2, black can pop out with another check. This pretty much disrupts white's tactical ideas. Because if we, he were to play, for example, c3, we would take, and now um, taking would be bad due to this being hanging. So after the queen check, white would return, and conceivably, this could be a perpetual check. That's the worst case for black. Worst case is a perpetual check draw. Anything else to do? Let's see. We have this position. White just leapt in with the knight. Well, we could take it immediately. And now, instead of moving the knight, which would be horrible due to the bishop check, we can pop in with b3 again. That's a pretty interesting way to play. Suppose white were to take with the c-pawn. Does that help? No, taking with the c-pawn is bad because I bring the bishop to the long diagonal before white can get on a long diagonal. And now if white were, for example, to take on c6, black is crushing white with an immediate and deadly attack. So this would be completely losing for white. Therefore, white's best advised to return to this, a, b, and then black uh, will probably be delivering perpetual check. In fact, he could delay the perpetual check with one move by knight e5, but after white takes, the best is, again, for black to run back with the queen, hitting the d5 pawn, white protects the d5 pawn, and we have this uh, well-known drawing motif. So that was an exciting variation that ended in a draw. White actually had to be clever to find this resource, which was not a very expected resource, this uh, knight to d5. Without knight to d5, he's in very bad shape. 
there's actually a uh, there's actually no other move because of knight to b1 we're taking and white is nowhere near a successful attack whereas black can play his pieces out easily and operate on the uh, semi-open c file for example the knight can come to a5 in some moments the bishop will move some rook will come to c8 it's going to be very nasty for white so white gets credit for the knight d5 which is in effect a drawing mechanism this is a good overview of the knight c6 line. I'd like you to take a look at it and maybe try in your own games and let me know what you thought of it or what experiences you had. I'll set up an entry on chess.com so we can all comment. And next time we're going to be looking at another line in the carries attack, which I will briefly demonstrate. We're going to be looking at a whole different complex of lines, which are very sharp and little explored. One of the first sharp lines we're going to look at is the immediate e5, which has positional justification. It looks ridiculous giving away all the light squares, but in fact, black's going to lay claim to the dark squares. It's a very double-edged situation. We're also going to be looking at a very sharp line involving h6 first, and then a later e5, which similar ideas. That's what Nispiano did. And those two will occupy a great deal of time. But today, remember, we did knight c6, which is a, a viable move. So thank you very much. I will be rejoining you with further discussions on the carries attack next time.